If James Levine, Francis Ford Coppola, Ricardo Muti, and Placido Domingo told you there was a new book they loved by an historian of music who teaches at Curtis, wouldn't you want to rush out and buy a copy? If so, you've come to the right place, because the gentlemen noted above have all offered great praise for Harvey Sachs's new biography, Toscanini, Musician of Conscience. Similarly, the critic Max Lopert, writing in the BBC Music Magazine, opines, monumental is surely the mojus to describe the book's length, but equally the combination of thoroughness, clarity, psychological perspicacity, and deep human feeling, which distinguishes every page. The book offers an in-depth portrait of an utterly extraordinary man, simultaneous with a panoramic cultural and political history of his near century of life, and a no less wide-ranging analysis of all the areas of music and theater over which he has gained st such staggeringly complete command. I could tell you more, but it's all in your program. Please welcome Harvey Sachs. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. A uh, sort of convergence of anniversaries, you know, our celebrations of the decimal system uh, are occurring this year uh, with respect to Arturo Toscanini. Uh, the 150th anniversary of his birth, March 25th, just passed. A little earlier, January 16th, was the 60th anniversary of his death. And later this year, December 25th, will be the 80th anniversary of the first concert of the NBC Symphony Orchestra, which was his last uh, post uh, as music director. So all of these things have converged to make this a big anniversary year. And uh, by chance, actually, because originally the book was to have come out last year, uh, it turns out that it's coming out in this anniversary year, my new biography of Toscanini. I did a biography of him that was published almost 40 years ago, when I was only two years old. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and at that time, I had the advantage of being able to talk with a lot of people who had known him, his children, his grandchildren, a lot of musicians and singers who had worked directly with him, et cetera, et cetera. But the disadvantage at that time was that the family archives were completely tied up. They had been moved out of his son's house uh, when his son became ill and then died. Um, they were in the basement of the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center, and nobody, not even the Toscanini family, could get at them at that point. So um, also La Scala's archives were uh, unreachable, the Ricordi Publishing Company's archives, Ricordi Company that had published all of the major Italian opera composers of the 19th century, their archives were out of bounds, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> gradually over the, especially during the 1990s and onward, uh, a lot of this material gradually became available. And uh, also caches of letters that Toscanini had written became available gradually in the 1990s. So I was able to publish in 2002 a collection of his letters. And um, that led me eventually to think about doing a new, an entirely new biography of the maestro, which the results of that uh, attempt are now available. So I just want very briefly to summarize the uh, basic outline of this extraordinary career because we have you know, a life that lasted just a few weeks short of 90 years, which was quite unusual for somebody born in 1867, and a life that was so filled with music and with events and, and um, participation 
in many cases unwillingly in the political history of his time, um, that I think it's, it's quite interesting to see how he fits in with uh, the various things that were going on in the musical world and outside the musical world. So, as I said, Toscanini was born in 1867 in the town of Parma in northern Italy. He attended the Parma Conservatory uh, from the age of nine to the age of 18. His principal instrument was the cello, but he studied composition. He learned to become absolutely fluent at the piano. And his extraordinary talents were discovered when he was a student there. The fact that he had a photographic memory, for one thing. Uh, his absolute pitch, absolute ear for music, and his tremendous passion for music uh, was already evident in those early years. When he was 19, he was engaged as principal cellist and assistant chorus master of an, an itinerant Italian opera company that was performing in Brazil. And while there, the principal conductor uh, withdrew for various reasons, a long, complicated story. Uh, but the, Toscanini was asked to take over the performance. And it was a performance of Aida, which he conducted entirely from memory. And then he took over the rest of the tour, uh, rehearsing and performing 12 different operas entirely from memory. He got back to Italy began a career as a sort of apprentice, uh, journeyman conductor, working in uh, minor and gradually more important Italian opera houses. In 1895, he, at the age of 28, he became principal conductor of the Teatro Reggio in Turin, um, conducted the first Italian production of Wagner's Goethe Demerung, conducted the world premiere of La Boheme in 1896. Uh, he had already, by the way, at the age of 25, conducted the world premiere of Pagliacci, Leon Cavallo's big hit. And um, in 98, at the age of 31, he became principal conductor of La Scala in Milan, which was the highest position that his country could offer him. He uh, worked there for the better part of 10 years. There was a break at one point. Uh, but in 1908, he came to New York for the first time as co-principal conductor, essentially, with Gustav Mahler at the Metropolitan Opera. Imagine having Mahler and Toscanini as your co-conductors. Uh, that's a combination that I think had never been equaled before and has never been equaled since anywhere. <clears throat> in any case, he left the Met in 1915. He conducted only benefit events in Italy during the First World War. And uh, then in 1920, he was asked to take over the uh, sort of reformation and reestablishment of La Scala, which he did. Um, he became principal conductor of the ensemble for eight years, which are con still considered uh, the golden age in La Scala's history. Uh, at the same time, 1926, he began making annual trips to New York to conduct the New York Philharmonic and uh, remained, became eventually its principal conductor and remained in that position until 1936 when he felt he was getting too old to uh, keep up the schedule of four or five rehearsals and four performances every week with the orchestra. So he retired in a manner of speaking. Um, before that, in 1930, he became the first non-German school conductor to perform at the Bayreuth Festival, the Wagner Festival in Germany where he was tremendously successful. In 31, he returned to Bayreuth, and he was to have gone back in 1933, but in January 33, Hitler came to power, and Toscanini, who had already had very negative experiences with Mussolini's fascist regime in Italy, refused to conduct in, uh, in Germany. In fact, in 31, he had been 
physically attacked by fa young fascists in uh, the town of Bologna in Italy. And <clears throat> at that point, he said that he would no longer conduct in Italy as long as the fascists were in power. Um, after his withdrawal from uh, the Bayreuth Festival, he began to do what he had done very seldom before that. He had always preferred working steadily with one or two different ensembles, an opera company and an orchestra, on a regular basis. He had done very little guest conducting. He didn't like that, uh, the feeling of coming in before a new orchestra and you know, having to put things together quickly. He had worked with the Philadelphia Orchestra for the first time in 1930 with great success, and he eventually came back here many times in the 1940s. But um, in the 30s, he realized that, you know, he was so famous at that point that he could make a stronger statement against the fascist and Nazi regimes by conducting in countries that surrounded the countries he wouldn't conduct in. So he began doing guest conducting in uh, France, in uh, Austria, in Hungary, in Czechoslovakia, in Sweden, in Denmark, and so on and so forth. He came, uh, he conducted the Vienna Philharmonic for the first time in 33, again with huge success. From 34 on, he conducted the Philharmonic also at the Salzburg Festival. And uh, that's where, from 30, in 35, 36, 37, he gave his last performances of fully staged operas. Some of them in 1937 were actually recorded. Um, in 36, as I mentioned, he withdrew from the Philharmonic. He increased his, or strengthened, I should say, his protest against the Nazis by going at his own expense and with no fee to Palestine in 1936 to conduct the inaugural concerts of what is now the Israel Philharmonic to show his solidarity with Jewish musicians who had lost their uh, jobs in Germany. And he returned there again at his own expense in 1938 to do another series of concerts. And he would have gone back in uh, years after that, but of course the war, Second World War broke out. In 37, he came back to New York as conductor of this newly formed, for him, NBC Symphony Orchestra that David Sarnoff, the president or chairman of the board of the Radio Corporation of America had created. And it was a much easier job than working with a regular symphony orchestra because they gave only one performance a week and he had to do only 10 to 12, eventually 16 weeks of performances a year. So he began this venture when he was 70 years old he figured he would do it for maybe three seasons, but he ended up doing it for 17 seasons until he retired at the age of 87. Um, he also, after the Second World War, he did return to Italy, um, conducted the reopening concert of La Scala, which had been heavily bomb damaged during the war, and um, that was really I think the most emotional and culminating moment of his life was when he returned to his, his audience, his public, in his country. Uh, he retired, as I said, in 1954 at the age of 87 and died at his home in Riverdale, New York, uh, in January 1957, just a few weeks short of his 90th birthday. So that, in a very small nutshell, is the uh, story, the, the outlines of the career of Arturo Toscanini. I want to, I've brought some uh, video material to show you. Uh, some of you will have seen some of this undoubtedly uh, before. But I wanted to talk a moment about Toscanini, uh, the conductor, why you know, we, it's a huge subject to talk about his uh, approach to interpretation and so on. I can't go into all of that in half an hour or 40 minutes. But um, it's very interesting 
to uh, note that although he was famous for his uh, bad temper and um, difficult personality when he was in front of an orchestra, he had the sort of old-fashioned uh, lion tamer approach to, uh, to rehearsing, uh, and that too is explicable because in his youth, there were no steady orchestras in Italy. Every season, the orchestra had to be regrouped and some kind of external discipline had to be applied to a bunch of unruly musicians. And he simply got used to that approach to, to conducting and maintained it throughout his career. <clears throat> he was not that way off the podium, by the way. His family and friends always talked about him as an extremely gentle and kind and generous person. But music was so important that, went that when he was in the middle of his work, uh, there were no restrictions on his <laughs> approach to what he was doing. <clears throat> I want to show you um, if we can see a bit of this home video, the home f movie actually, that his son uh, Walter Toscanini uh, filmed unbeknownst to his father in 1939. There's a silent movie of Toscanini in rehearsal and this is the only film we have of him rehearsing an orchestra. And you will notice that his gestures can be very violent at times, that he's trying very hard to extract everything he can as quickly as possible from the musicians, which, by the way, is one of the reasons why orchestras loved working with him, even though he was very demanding and at times intolerant. Um, Everything happened as quickly as possible. The worst thing for an orchestra musician is boredom. And, you know, sitting around and, you know, thinking, oh my God, another 15 minutes till the rehearsal is over. Will I survive? With Toscanini, everything was moving all the time. And he would even, uh, it, because he, of his photographic memory and his ability to focus simultaneously on what was coming out of the orchestra, and what was about to happen musically, he could, he would sometimes shout to the orchestra during the rehearsal, horns, get ready. You know, this, that, whatever it was, whatever was going to happen. And he would cue with his eyes, more even than with the baton, he would cue players in advance, like alerting them to what, you know, remember what you have to do next. So things moved very quickly. In performance, on the other hand, he was always very controlled in his gestures, which is the opposite of the way a lot of conductors are. A lot of conductors sit at rehearsals and you know, do things as calmly as possible, which is perfectly legitimate, and then add the choreography <coughs> at performances. This was not true, not only of Toscanini, of most conductors of the pre-television generation. They didn't know that they were supposed to express the music's emotion for the audience. They were just helping the orchestra to realize what they had worked out in rehearsal. But let's watch a minute or two of Toscanini rehearsing the NBC Symphony in 1939. This is in Studio 8H at Rockefeller Center, the RCA building. And you notice that his gestures can be quite big and you know that he's really trying to get the maximum possible as quickly as possible.
<laughs> no, I haven't. And there's different pieces, you know, we don't know. <clears throat> I know that one of the pieces in this rehearsal segment is the uh, Ride of the Valkyries from <clears throat> Die Valkyrie of Wagner, but um, that's in three, and most of what he's conducting here is in two or four. Okay, that's, that's enough of that. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no sound with it. You know, that would be really fascinating. Now, in a moment, give them time to switch machines here. Um, I'm going to show you one of, uh, a, a part of one of the ten televised concerts that he conducted with the uh, NBC Symphony between 1948 and 52. So Toscanini was a pioneer in radio and sort of inadvertently also in television. In uh, the mid-40s, the Musicians Union had put a ban on uh, musicians performing for television until a contract could be worked out. And in, I think, uh, March 1948, the union lifted the ban and the first orchestra to perform on television was the Philadelphia Orchestra with Eugene Ormandy. One hour later, Toscanini's first concert was tele or uh, a Toscanini NBC Symphony concert was televised. Ormandy was with was on CBS and Toscanini on NBC. What I want to show you is uh, the Andante from the second movement of the Mozart G minor symphony, the symphony number 40, K550. Um, I want to show you this piece, even though Toscanini was not primarily known as a Mozart conductor, because it will give you an idea of what the musicians working with him saw when he conducted. So in this uh, piece, which lasts about seven minutes, I think, um, you will see how he gives them every signal that they need, but nothing that they don't need. So everything is absolutely clear. There is the feeling of motion moving forward always, as George Sell said about Toscanini, everything was movement and life in his performances, whether you agreed with them or didn't agree with them. Um, there was never a feeling of deadness in his performances. Um, so in this excerpt, you'll be able to see how he worked with the musicians, how he cued them only when they needed him. When he knew that they didn't need him, he left them alone. And that's another of the reasons why musicians loved playing with him, because he treated them like adults and not like children. He expected the best of them. So let's see, if we're ready, let's have a look at this excerpt. notice everything is right in front of him, so the audience saw nothing of that.
So, I'm sorry, we can't just go on and watch the, there are, you know, all 10 of these televised concerts are available on uh, DVDs. Um, <clears throat> you do get an idea, I think, through watching that, how he operated, how he worked with the orchestra, at least in performance. Um, very interesting, this feeling that, as I said before, he's there to help. He's not there to put on a performance for the audience. He's there only to help the orchestra to realize what they had worked out in rehearsal, to remind them. <clears throat> um, it's interesting, although of course he wasn't old enough to have known Mozart, a lot of the music that he conducted, and this was typical of a lot of conductors of his generation and previous and even one or two generations after his own, um, a lot of the music he conducted was contemporary music. So when Toscanini entered the Parma Conservatory in 1876 and began his adventure with music, uh, Wagner had not, well, it was the year of the first ring cycle. It was the year in which Brahms' first symphony was performed. Uh, Verdi had not written, his latest opera was Aida. He had not yet written Otello and Falstaff. Um, so this was still the height of the Romantic era, in a sense. And Toscanini was very much involved in the music of that period. And as I mentioned, he conducted the premieres of operas by many Italian composers, uh, Puccini in particular. He conducted the world premieres of La Boheme, 
La Fanciulla del West, The Girl of the Golden West, and Turandot, Tuscany, uh, Puccini's last opera. He conducted the Italian premieres of Peleas et Melisande of Debussy. He conducted a uh, co-premiere together with a premiere conducted by Richard Strauss in Turin. Toscanini simultaneously conducted a premiere of Salome in Milan at La Scala, the Italian premiere. Many, many works. Uh, first Italian production of Wagner's Siegfried, the first Italian production of Eugene Onegin, of Tchaikovsky, et cetera, et cetera, and a huge number of symphonic works. As he became older, his repertoire became more conservative, but in his day, he was a firebrand for uh, contemporary music. And of course, that was in those days considered the primary responsibility of musicians was to perform new music. And uh, opera audiences in particular were not interested in hearing old works. They wanted to hear what was hot off the presses, in a sense. So, and I've tried in my book to bring out a lot uh, of uh, information about how he spoke with Verdi. And we now know a lot of what went on because among the other sources that I had access to were about a hundred tapes of conversations that his son taped, again, unbeknownst to his father in his father's last years. Because since Toscanini hated publicity and never granted, inter or rarely granted interviews, and never wrote about himself for publication, um, his son thought, well, you know, when people come over and they uh, talk to him and they ask him, oh, you remember, what about such and such a singer? Uh, what did Verdi look like? And, you know, what, was your, what were your conversations with him? He would open up and, you know, he was very talkative and he joked a lot and, and so on. So uh, from those conversations, I was able to cull a lot of material uh, about his contacts with Puccini, with Verdi, with Richard Strauss, with WC, and so on and so forth. So um, a lot of that material is now available. Thank you very much. Can you tell us about his personal life? I know that uh, Horowitz was his son-in-law. How did they get along? Um, he got along quite well with Horowitz. Uh, he, you know, Toscanini was basically a, a pretty healthy guy. He uh, couldn't understand how Horowitz had these periods of withdrawal from the concert stage, and he felt that Horowitz was imagining that he, you know, was ill, whereas he wasn't really ill. But he admired Horowitz's playing very much, and they played together on several occasions. His personal life, I mean, he was married at the age of 30, and he remained married to the same long-suffering woman for 54 years, um, typical Italian male of his generation. He had a lot of affairs, but one wife, you know, he did not believe in divorce. He was not a practicing Catholic, but he did not believe in divorce, and... Um, but he felt, you know, man could have as many mistresses as he wanted, or as were available to him, anyway. <laughs> so, but he was a good father, um, good to his children. They all loved him. Uh, Vanda, the one, the daughter who married Vladimir Horvitz, had a difficult personality. The others were all, I knew them, and they were very pleasant, and, and uh, always spoke of their father with great affection. And I think it's uh, interesting that Walter Toscanini, who knew his father's strong and weak points as a person, said, I think he was even a greater human being than he was a musician. So um, it's very, to me, that's a very telling statement. I guess the question I have is the way that you present, particularly towards the end, as the conductor that you're talking about, would you say that it's that it's okay to assume that the conductor was very much like the first DJ in terms of like relating music to a broader audience or almost like an anthologist, so to speak, where that was the person that kind of got 
the composer and was able to share it with a broader audience in the way that, that he or, well, I mean, obviously it's he, there is no she at the time, but, but the way that he understood it. Um, I think, you know, uh, of course, Toscanini, born in 1867, before the invention of phonograph, radio, television, and so on, uh, only gradually understood the importance of being able to disseminate music to a broad public once the means were available to him. He did not like the recording process at all in its early years, in the days of acoustic recording when they you know, recorded into the big horn onto a wax cylinder and the sound was, you know, sounded nothing like what he heard when he was conducting an orchestra. Uh, he really detested the process. Um, then as, you know, with, when in 1925-26, the electrical recording process became available uh, with the micro use of the microphone um, and gradually the ability to to record sound that was at least vaguely uh, similar to what you heard in a live performance, when that became possible, he uh, gradually came to understand the importance of transmitting music to a larger public. And beginning in the uh, late 20s, when he was with the New York Philharmonic, Many of his radio, many of his concerts were broadcast on the radio. At first, only within a relatively small range—New York, New Jersey, and so on—but uh, gradually it became possible to make the radio hookups, and so they became continental, and then uh, via shortwave, uh, global practically, and. I think that's why in 37 he agreed to conduct the NBC Symphony Orchestra, this new adventure, even though he was 70 years old at the time. He felt that he could communicate great music to a much broader public than had previously been possible. And because his name was so well known worldwide practically, um, he took advantage of that. He hated being famous on the one hand, but on the other, he took advantage of it to be able to bring great music to as many people as possible. So I think that that was truly, and that's why he also agreed to do these television concerts in a very pioneering way. I mean, as you could see from the way they move the camera in a very uncertain uh, way at times, they really didn't know yet what they were doing in 1948. By the way, he was 81 when that uh, concert was uh, televised um, and the, in those days the, they had no way of really masking these very strong stage lights that they needed for the television cameras of the day and in some of the performances you see him um, he looks like he's about to faint from the heat from sweating but he decided it was more important to do that uh, despite all the disadvantages, than not to do it. So I think that um, that, that was you know, a key element in his uh, approach in his later years. And he became, especially once in the late 40s when magnetic tape and LPs became available, he became really quite enthusiastic about the recording process and felt that he could leave something of his work for the uh, for future generations. What do you think inspired him more than anything else? I think the music itself. It, it he he would say sometimes I, I am I'm made up of music. You know that from the time he was very young, the, the music possessed him, and. Um, it, it was so important to him. That's also why he would lose his temper and during rehearsals and so on. Um, by the way, he almost never lost his temper if somebody made a mistake. You know, he would correct it or he knew that they would correct themselves or whatever. You know, the horn cracked or clarinet uh, made a, a whistling sound or something. 
He never even stopped for mistakes like that. When he got angry was when he felt that people were not concentrating, not, you know, on the edge of their chairs giving everything as he did. Um, you know, th this was what disturbed him because this was his all-consuming passion. And he says in some of his private letters, you know, that um, he would complain sometimes, oh, I'm going to conduct another, I don't even want to face another orchestra. But then he would say, work is the only thing that saves me. You know, I have to work. I have to work. Life is no good without it. And, you know, the music was his, his whole being, really. Uh, he was also, he loved painting, he, not, not himself, he loved observing painting. He loved literature, he was a tremendous reader. He would take, when, you know, in the days of ocean travel, pre-air uh, travel, when he would go to South America or to the United States from Europe or back, he would take a trunk load of books with him to read during these long voyages. So he was always very interested in the other arts, and of course he paid attention, as I mentioned, to the political situation. He hated racism, he hated, uh, he was uh, on the one hand a very patriotic Italian, but he hated imperialism, he, you know, that sort of thing. But the music is what really consumed him and what, what made him who he was. Thank you. First, I'd like to say the way he conducts his face is so at ease and at peace. Uh, when you go to the Kim or sit in the conductor cir circle and you watch the conductors, they have such contortions of their faces. So it's really amazing to see someone who is so much at, at ease. Uh, so really, uh, you talked about he was very um, aware of racism, whatever. What did he think about uh, integrating the, the uh, orchestra with women or with other races, whatever, or was that just at this time that those were the supreme uh, musicians? You know, it, in his day, it was almost not an issue. Um, orchestra, symphony orchestras were basically all male. They were all white. Um, you know, uh, I don't know his opinion of any, of any of this sort of thing. I do know on one of the conversation tapes, um, somebody mentions that there was a, a TV performance of, I think, uh, Tosca. And this woman says with, you know, great, cons almost opprobrium, you know, there's a, there, there is a Negro woman who's singing the part of Tosca. Can you imagine? And Toscanini says, how does she sing? <laughs> That's the only thing that interested him. He didn't care what color she was. All he cared about was, did she sing well? <clears throat> so, um, you know, he was only concerned about musical, uh, the musical aspects. You know, even 1960, when I, late 50s, early 60s, when I started going to, to concerts, there were, in, in Cleveland, where I grew up, there were maybe two women in the orchestra. There was one African-American cellist in the Cleveland Orchestra, and that was it. You know, it, and it, that was already something compared to most orchestras where there were no women or maybe the harpist was a woman and no black instrumentalists at all. And now, of course, we have Asians, we have everything, which is, you know, great. I'm sure he would have approved of that entirely, but it just didn't exist in his day. Can you talk a little bit about whence he drew his political, liberal ideas? Was his family working class? And how, how difficult was it for him in Italy of the, 19, of the 1870s to be given the actual opportunity to further his... I mean, clearly they saw that he was a genius, but, you know, if, if you weren't able to navigate the, connect, the connections, you weren't going to be recognized and you weren't going to go forward. So could you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, he came from what, what was considered the artisan class 
in, in Italy in his day. His, uh, his grandfather had owned a textile mill uh, in uh, Corte Maggiore, which is between Parma and Piacenza, sort of in northern Italy. His father was a tailor who had uh, very little taste for work um, and was kind of an adventurer. And he joined Garibaldi's forces <clears throat> in the uh, wars of uh, the Risorgimento, the Italian reunification movement. So, um, and he, uh, after the excitement was over, after the reunification took place, uh, Claudio Toscanini, the future maestro's father, became a heavy drinker and chased women and so on. So he was not a responsible father, but he was a radical, politically radical, and he inculcated that in his son. So the idea uh, that the church was an oppressor, for instance, and the monarchy was oppressive, these are things that went into Toscanini's brain as a very as a child, actually, and that he never, uh, never uh, gave up as an idea, as ideas. Um, and, you know, he maintained those ideas. When he, in 1919, uh, supported this new political party that was uh, headed by uh, a, an ex journalist, a radical to the left of the Socialist Party in Italy named Benito Mussolini. Um, the platform was like a Bolshevik platform. I mean, the abolition of the banks and the stock exchange and the monarchy and uh, taxes on ecclesiastical properties and uh, votes for women and, you know, you name it. Um, then, of course, when Mussolini, within three years, veered from the extreme left to the extreme right, Toscanini said, if I were capable of killing a man, I would kill Mussolini. So he maintained these liberal ideas, liberal not to say radical ideas, uh, throughout his, his life. As far as his entrance into the conservatory, you know, being a musician was considered like Entering the conservatory was a form of apprenticeship, the way you would be apprenticed to a shoemaker or, you know, a welder or whatever there was uh, in those days. His mother's family were uh, um, uh, craftspeople in the glass industry. Uh, there was an important glass making factory in Parma and his maternal grandfather was a very well-known and uh, honored glassmaker. So they, were, they weren't considered a peasant class because the peasants were people who worked the land. They were artisan class. Now they had no connections or political clout whatsoever, <clears throat> but um, it was one of Toscanini's elementary school teachers who recognized his talent very early on, um, she realized, uh, first of all, that if they learned a poem in school, or read a poem once, he memorized it. He knew it by heart after that, no matter whether it was a short one or a long one. And that when she would, when they would sing a song or she would play something on the piano for the class, he immediately memorized it. And he asked, he heard that she had a piano in her home, and he asked, could he go and play on it? And he would pick things out immediately. So she went to his father and said, you should apply to have him enter the conservatory. And the family was only too happy because they were boarding students at the conservatory, and it was subsidized by the state. So it meant that one less mouth to feed in the family, you know. So basically it was an apprenticeship and uh, the family was very happy that he <laughs> managed to get a position there as a student. I just want to understand, he conducted Turandot and he stopped at the point when Puccini stopped, didn't write anymore. So what happened to the stage and what happened at that point with the action okay. of the opera? Yes, in 19, 
1924, uh, Puccini died without having completed the last scene of his final opera, Turandot. And uh, <clears throat> at the very first performance, which Toscanini conducted two years later in 1926, in the meantime, they had had uh, another composer, Franco Alfano, write an ending to the opera. But at the very first performance at the world premiere at La Scala, uh, at the point where Puccini had stopped composing, Toscanini brought the music to a close, put down his baton, turned to the audience, and he almost never said anything in public to anybody. Uh, but he turned to the audience and said something like, we don't know the exact words, but at this point the maestro died and left. And the action just stopped on the stage. It was Rosa Raiza was the Turandot. <clears throat> um, Miguel Fleta was Calaf. It was at the point after Liu's death in the opera. And they just closed the curtain, and that was the end. But from the second performance on, it was performed with the Alfano ending. No, it's during the last act. It's in the last act. It's only the last scene that Puccini did not... It's an opera in three acts, and it's only the last scene of the last act that Puccini did not managed to finish. And so uh, that's when the curtain closed and, and that was the end at the very first performance. Now this, was it you who asked about the uh, Mahler? Yes, Would you say something about the relationship between Mahler and Toscanini? The relationship between Mahler and Toscanini, yes. <clears throat> um, uh, Toscanini, like most other, especially non-German school conductors of his generation, had no understanding whatsoever of Mahler's music. And, you know, the Mahler revival didn't really begin until the 1960s when Toscanini was already dead. It was the Mahler disciples like Bruno Walter and uh, Otto Klemperer who kept the flame, well, Bernstein much later, but of, of the earlier generations, uh, they're the ones who kept the flame alive. Now, as far as their personal relations, <clears throat> Toscanini says repeatedly in the conversation tapes, which I quote in my book, uh, that he only went to the Met in 1908 because Mahler was there. He said, you know, Mahler in his lifetime was much better known as a conductor than as a composer. He had spent 10 years as conductor of what is now the Vienna State Opera. It was then the Vienna Court Opera. And um, he was known to be just as demanding and difficult as Toscanini was, and to have the same kind of concept of opera as a total work of art and not just something for vocal display. So um, <clears throat> he says repeatedly in the conversations, I came to New York to the Metropolitan because Mahler was there. I thought if Mahler is working there, it proves that a real musician can conduct there. And he mentions even that before that, in 1903, he had been invited to go to the Met when he made his first break at La, with La Scala, and he said, I asked Caruso, should I go? And Caruso said, you won't like it there because it's a place for singers and not for conductors. In other words, the audience only goes to hear, you know, the high C and that sort of thing. So, but when Mahler went in 1907, Toscanini the following year said, okay, when he was approached again, he said, yes, I can go. And he says in the conversation tapes, he says that, you know, Mahler was no longer at that point, he, you know, Mahler had severe heart problems, and um, he was no longer uh, the, uh, how shall we put it, tyrannical isn't the right word, but, you know, strict, authoritative uh, personality that he had been uh, before in Vienna and so on. 
Um, and Toscanini said, you know, there, I went to a dress rehearsal of The Marriage of Figaro where the singers uh, stopped everything and just to argue about where to put a chair on the stage. And he said Mahler didn't say anything to them. But he said Mahler was a very good opera conductor. And for Toscanini to say that about anybody, including himself, was something. He was very uh, sparse in his, sparing, I should say, in his <laughs> positive remarks about himself and other conductors. <clears throat> he was, uh, you know, his standards were very, very high. And he mentions that both Mahler and himself um, uh, disliked the boorish audiences in New York at the turn of the century where the you know, rich people would arrive only after the first act was over. It was considered bad form to get to the opera at the beginning of the opera. And he, he uh, mentions with a laugh that when Mahler conducted uh, Smetana's The Bartered Bride, which was done in German, by the way, at the Met at that time, um, and he said the, the orchestra played the overture so beautifully, Mahler decided to have the orchestra play the overture before the second act instead of before the first act so that people would actually hear it. <clears throat> so, um, you know, they were very different personalities. I don't think they had a lot of personal contact, but the respect was mutual. I mean, Mahler, uh, when, when Julius Korngold, the Viennese uh, music critic for the Neue Freie Presse and the father of Erich Wolfgang Korngold, the composer, uh, asked Mahler about Toscanini. Mahler said, he's really something, which again was not something that Mahler said a lot about uh, his fellow conductors. So that's it for tonight. I'm sorry uh, that it's over, but thank you very much for being here. And thank you for your attention.